Hello, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests and friends of Circularity. My name is Lenka Procházková and I am uh, head of Czech Liaison Office for Education and Research. And it is my privilege to welcome you at yet another edition of Science Café, this time as a partner even of the European Commission's Green Week. At today's special edition, we decided to focus on the very important topic of circularity. A topic present in our everyday lives and a topic that each one of us influences by their daily habits and small decisions that in turn shape our economy. To successfully deliver on its European Green Deal ambition, the EU needs to drive a global transition to a carbon neutral, resource efficient and circular economy, where resources used is decoupled from economic growth. That's why in 2020, the European Commission adopted the new Circular Economy Action Plan. The EU's transition to a circular economy will reduce pressure on natural resources and will create sustainable growth and jobs. It is also a prerequisite to achieve the EU's 2050 climate neutrality target and to halt biodiversity loss. This year's Green Week focuses on skills. And that is why we decided to hold the debate that will, next to aspects of circularity, also focus on the transfer of the circular know-how toward society, students and companies. Lastly, we are happy to organize this event with our partners who view circularity equally as important, and those are the representation of the South Moravian region to the EU, represented by Vendula Novačková, Czech Central Brussels, represented by Kristina Halonová, and also the colleagues uh, from representation of Prague to the EU. And now I'm happy to pass the word to the moderator of the evening, Mr. Petr Holík, who covers various climate-related topics in his great podcast 2050, that we can definitely recommend to listen, if you are interested. So I think we are in really good hands. Petr, the floor is yours. Hey everybody, can you hear me even in the back? Great, how are you? <laughs> yeah, good, I, I see some notes, so notes, notes are good. Thank you for having us, thank you for being here. Uh, big thanks go to, goes to the organizing team, so thank you very much for organizing this, this, uh, this great event. We are very excited to be here. Um, tonight's topic of this Science Cafe is circular literacy. By the way, it's, it's pretty hard to word to pronounce for me, circular. Is it, is it difficult for you as well? Yeah, for some, yeah, circular. I, I even, I have to admit, I even looked it up at Google Translator and made it, tell it, tell it back to me, so I learned to pronounce it, circular. And I have, to, I have to tell it over and over this whole evening, so I have to apologize in advance. If sometimes you don't understand what I'm saying, it's very probable that I'm trying to say the word circular. Circular. All right, so now you know. If you don't understand, is this word. Um, so what can you expect from, uh, from tonight, except from my bad pronunciation? Uh, we have two great guests whom I will introduce shortly, and uh, they will start with a short presentations to just to introduce their work and uh, the, the topic of their, of their focus. And then uh, I have prepared some questions for them. Uh, so we will, we will discuss it here and later in the second part of the evening there will be a lot of space and a lot of time for your questions and, uh, and a very big discussion. So if you have questions already or if some questions uh, appear in your mind during our talk, uh, please save them for later and, and we will have definitely have time for, to, to discuss it all. Um, let me introduce our guests or first of our guests. First one is Vladimir Kochi. And he's a lecturer uh, at both University of Chemistry and Technology in Prague and also Czech Technical University in Prague. Hey, you can, can come in. Can I come in? Big applause for Vladimir, please. <laughs> so Vladimir focuses on product ecology and sustainability. In 2021, he founded LCA Studio, which centers on life cycle analysis of products, services, and technologies, helping companies to reduce their carbon footprint. So stage is yours, <laughs> please. Uh, you show us your short presentation and introduce a bit of, bit of your work. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'm happy to be here with, uh, with you. Thank you very much for organizers for inviting me. For me, it's a nice uh, opportunity to introduce you 
one of the newest, maybe the really newest department, university department in Czech Republic. It is the uh, Department of Sustainability and Product Ecology. We have found not around two years ago, and now we have the first students of this uh, quite a new, new study program. I, in a couple of minutes, would like to introduce what we are doing to have some uh, idea for you. And we have uh, such uh, signs here <laughs> for communication. So we are at the University of Chemistry and Technology. So it's maybe strange for you why at this university are some people interested in sustainability and ecology and things like this. The reason is that uh, we are we have to understand our planet in some limit, in some planetary boundaries. And these boundaries are very often connected with our needs. And our needs is almost usually fulfilled by the industrial activities. So the industrial activities has to be somehow managed to be in the context of the planet. And that's why we as the principal industrial based university is working. The main tool we use for our work is methodology called life cycle assessment. It's a specific methodology which was based maybe 20, 30 years ago. And one of the maybe well known output of this method is the carbon footprint. So today, when we work and talk about the carbon footprinting of products, organizations, we have behind the LCA, like the principal methodological tool. And as well, in the context of circular economy, the LCA is the principal analytical tool, which is giving us some very values, data to evaluate if the solution we want to apply is more or less circular. Another specific case of LCA is the consequential LCA study. So, for example, if you want to change in policy something, like let's change the taxes of our personal work, let's change the taxes for uh, plastic packaging or something like this, and the LCA approach can give us some overview how this will help change the environmental impacts if such a policy will be applied. Another tool we use is material flow analysis. Contrary to LCA, it is both the, its top-down approach, evaluating the, some, some regions, for example, what uh, substances or, or, from, or, or what resources is going inside the region and what waste, for example, are released away into the, into the countryside. So, on, next. Next topic, try to combine somehow, this is the industrial symbiosis. We are helping to industrial companies to cooperate somehow and to use their outputs like inputs for another one. So there is some, uh, some domino effect in, uh, in our industrial daily business. And so the industrial symbiosis is some, some holistic approach trying to apply the win-win strategies for industries. Uh, one of the most developed uh, sector in this is the construction sector, which more than maybe 10 years ago started to apply some sustainability goals. We have also some sustainability uh, construction champs like LEED, BREEAM, and some, some other, other more developed techniques, which help us to evaluate what environmental burden has such a specific construction building or what, what you are interested in. So that's why we started in the construction industry, because it's the most developed in this area. Next is uh, contrary to the houses, the big things we are living in, we have uh, small things we use like microphone, like my, my jacket. So we focus also on products of daily life and we want to evaluate its environmental impacts and trying to define them a way which will be 
more sustainable. Of course, there is no, no product can be sustainable. More sustainable can be our approach to life, but we can use more or less environmental friendly products for fulfilling our needs. So this is why we, we have in our group also designers, which industrial designers, which try to apply some ecological aspects into their design work. One of a specific topic of our department is also the, the food, food and drinking, because uh, one of the main environmental impacts besides of energy consumption is the food we, we need every day. And that's why we try to also evaluate the, the, the food habits of different countries, different uh, uh, habit styles like vegetarian and vegans, etc. And everything this can give us some new ideas how to be more sustainable <laughs> in, in simple world. Uh, one of the very important point of our work is the resource security. Our, our understanding of sustainability is that we have to count at the first line with the resources and the energy resources and then with all other things. I don't want stress that only these two make the sustainability. But I, I want to underline them because we very often forget about the resources in the context of sustainability. One, two years ago, when our colleagues presented some work about the sustainability, we always had the resources there, like one of the output beside of the carbon footprint, for example. And the people, others, said, why, why are you interested in resources? It's not about the nature protection now and, or about uh, sustainability. Now, after one big change, like the war in Ukraine, you see that the resources are the principal thing in our sustainability way of life. So that's why uh, this is also the answer to the question why on the technical university we solve the sustainability. Because without resources, it's not possible to do. Next, please. And finally, some examples of our research. This is uh, one of the biggest uh, projects we have uh, in Czech Republic today. It's uh, the Center of Environmental Research, Waste Management, Circular Economy and Environmental Security. We, we cover maybe 10 different organizations and uh, universities, and we solve some problems about the sustainability, about the circular economy, industrial symbiosis, etc. Another example of our work is, uh, contrary to the previous one, is the Aptomat project, which is focused only on aluminium. Nothing else, only aluminium. But aluminium is quite a good example for circular economy because it's a metal which can be used in a circular system. And if we use it again and again, we save a lot of energy, which is ordinarily needed for a production of virgin aluminium. So it, it makes a big sense to, to do something in the circularity with the aluminium. We have a lot of partners from, uh, from other countries, uh, starting from Turkey to Portugal, from uh, Sweden till uh, to Serbia, so going across all the Europe. Next, please. And uh, as uh, our Exper expertise is focused mainly on the industrial companies. We also offer our knowledge as a service for the business partners and we uh, founded the LCA studio like private company which is now uh, focused on the carbon footprint calculation certifications and uh, we do also the product focus carbon footprint and the organization carbon footprint because they are but different things, both of them are quite crucial in these days. We have now plenty of uh, business partners, which we are happy. If I talk about the carbon footprint, please don't forget that there are more environmental problems, not only the climate change, maybe one of the most important of these days, but it's not the only one. The life cycle assessment is a good tool which can give you some overview if the if the technology which is focused, for example, for diminishing of the carbon footprint is not problematic in other way. For example, producing more toxic substances in the, on the countryside. So never forget that 
carbon footprint is not the overall environmental indicator. It's one of several of them, and all of them has to be evaluated somehow in, in common holistic. We also do the uh, sustainability summit, which is now now established in a meeting of uh, sustainability managers. Why for the sustainability managers? Because sustainability manager is emerging new job. A couple of years ago, there was not, nothing like this. And now almost every company, namely in industrial branch, need at least one, but very often more and more people working in the sustainability consultancy or sustainability management. And we established this as an annual meeting for these people which want to meet and exchange their knowledge and experience. And because we need also to educate these sustainability managers, we established and we have already accredited a new study program, the engineer level, so master of science level study program, sustainability and circular economy, which is uh, consisting of, let's say, three branches. One branch is more technological, like, uh, like uh, waste technology, water technology, cleaning uh, air technologies. The second is the analytical branch, like life cycle assessment, material flow analysis, uh, etc. And the third one is more the governmental, like uh, in the context of ESG governmental, I mean that you do the management, the, the HR, the PR, and all these, uh, all these uh, tools we have to use. And this is almost final slide, I think. Yes, we, we also offer some uh, lifelong uh, learning courses for people already working in both in the circular economy and the sustainability management. Yes, because it's also the role of the university, not only to teach the students, but also to be in contact with people from the practice. So thank you very much for waiting so long for this long introduction. I'm sorry for this, but I wanted to give you some framework of our, our interest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vladimir. But at least everybody now knows we have a lot of topics to ask you about later in the discussion, so thank you for this introduction. And I would like to introduce our second guest, last but not least, and also second. <laughs> it's Pavel Zedniček. Please give him a big applause and then i tell you something about him. Pavel is the CEO of the Institute of Circular Economy. They put it in the name of their company, so respect. They are focusing on consulting, research, advocacy and network development. In addition to the Institute's industry de decarbonization study, of which he is the initiator and co-author, Pavel has undertaken consulting projects for firms and public authorities in the Czech Republic related to the circular economy. Pavel. Yes, thank you Your very introductory much. presentation, go for it. Thank you. I'm just going to try to put this a little bit because I have problems with cables. It happened to me on the last one. Gentlemen, you, you are making it very hard for the camera people, you know. <laughs> okay, so, all right. So maybe I'll... I don't want to, is it fine like this? Cool, because I don't want to sit down and I'll bore you. So, uh, good evening everybody. Thank you for uh, coming here in such large numbers. My name is Pavel, as uh, Peter already mentioned, and I'm actually a graduate of the University of Chemistry and Technology that uh, Mr. Kochi mentioned. Uh, he was actually my teacher, so I hope I won't be graded tomorrow or today after the, after the input, uh, but I do think that uh, um, he has done great work in terms of uh, propagating circular economy, LCA, and other topics that he had already mentioned. So really, thanks a lot for that. Um, I'm representing here an NGO, or a you could call a think tank, which is called Institute of Circular Economy. Uh, we've been set up in 2014 and uh, trying to work on the topic of circular economy. I don't have a presentation, so I'll just uh, give you a few numbers, or maybe a few thoughts from, from my end. Maybe, how did I get into the topic? I was firstly studying the, uh, the University of Chemistry and Technology. And if actually the course that uh, Mr. Kochi had mentioned was there already maybe a few years ago, I would not even leave to the Netherlands where I was actually studying afterwards because I was actually looking for a course like this and I'm super, hap super happy that it is happening right now in the Czech Republic. Um, I then came back uh, with the vision to, of course, change the Czech Republic, but I'm now uh, realizing that it's not happening and it's not going to happen for quite some time, but we're trying our best. Um, what do we do as an organization? I guess that's your main question. So we're, it's around 12 to 15 people that we work with. And the reason why we're here is that while circular economy is a great topic, 
and we're going to discuss why it is a great topic. It is not a reality. It is not a reality in the Czech Republic, but it's also not a reality in the European Union yet. That's why we have all the different regulations coming up from the EU, uh, because the system which is uh, right now in place is not actually supporting circular economy businesses. So in short, I would say circular economy at this point is not a very good business case. And the reason for that is that the system is not well set up for that. I mean, it's still very easy to uh, get rid of the waste. It's actually still one of the easiest ways. One of the numbers is that still in the Czech Republic, uh, half of the munici municipal waste is being landfilled. Uh, another, let's say 12 to 15% is being incinerated. So if we're lucky, I guess, one third of the produced waste annually is being recycled. And we try to change that. Uh, how we try to change that? Well, we work on research. So we publish reports that actually show, hey, this is how circular economy could help. This is how it could work. There are some recommendations how we can move that forward. So that's one thing. The other one is that where we work with companies directly, implementing circular economy into into their practices. The third pillar upon we which upon we uh, which uh, base our operations is um, that we build community. So we have around sixty-five organization on our platform, which we call Check Circle Hotspot, and we try to create a movement around it, a, a place where company representatives, universities, startups can come and discuss it, but also as a movement of force. And of course, last but not least, there are some advocacy activities. So we try to change the landscape. We try to promote some regulation that will actually make circular business models profitable, which is un unfortunately in the mainstream still not the case. So that's about me, that's about the Institute. I think that the topic of circular economy uh, is fascinating. It actually uh, is the reason why I'm um, spending my more than eight hours per day uh, time of it. And the reason for that, I think it, it asks a simple question. Can we, can we increase or maybe sustain or maintain our prosperity while um, consuming less resources? Because up until now, we've been doing the opposite. We've been actually increasing our prosperity by consuming more resources, thereby producing more waste. And we have to change that. So that's the key uh, question circular economy asks. There are many answers to that, and we're going to explore them today. Thank you very much, Pavel. Thanks. All right, so we've been we've been circling the topic of circular economy for a while, <laughs> a little bit. And uh, just to get us all on the same page, I would like to start with very basic introductory question, but maybe it's not so basic. We will see. And that's uh, what actually is circular economy? And maybe another question hidden in there, what isn't? Because uh, uh, earlier today, we were talking about that, that maybe sometimes people like interchange things and uh, put things into the circular economy area that uh, that shouldn't be there and so on. So maybe Vladimir, could you could you start with this question? What what is actually circular economy and and what isn't? Mm. Circular economy is one of the conception of the environmental protection. That means that uh, we have uh, in the context of environmental protection we have tools like uh, some specific analytical methods or some taxes or improvement so there are the tools then we have concepts like circular economy like green chemistry like integrated prevention of pollutants etc and finally we have the strategies like strategy of sustainability so this is three level how to say three level systems and we very often change the tools with the concept and with the strategies. In this context, it's good to know that circular economy is one of the concepts of the sustainability as a strategy. And as any concept, even the circular economy has several specific tools which can help to uh, apply and to realize the circularity as it is. I'd like to maybe a little bit follow up uh, on some things you you said in the end of your your short presentation, um, because the, the, the my question is, why are we really talking about circular economy? Because it's it's one of the concepts, as you said, and it seems to be important concept when people are organizing science cafes about it. So, uh, where maybe where can circular economy help from the high level perspective, and why is it important? Right. Um, 
Yeah, so I think it's important to state, say that it is a concept and it is a, a path or a way how to achieve something. And what is it that we want to actually achieve, right? And uh, I think Mr. Kochi in his first slide mentioned the, the planetary boundaries or planet, planetary limits that um, we are facing, right? We are living on a finite planet and we have to somehow deal with that. And we have to solve the issues that come with it. And uh, whilst up until now we've been uh, consuming a lot of materials and we've been basing our our prosperity on that, uh, it's not going to work like that for a long time. So there is a time limit to it. And circular economy offers a path to that. And it actually says, or it's actually coming up with uh, other questions and answers and it's trying to uh, resolve this one with saying, Okay, so let's find ways how we can actually consume less materials. Let's find ways how we can actually produce less materials, consume less materials. But it has to come also with the B. Is it still going to be profitable, profitable for us from the long-term perspective? So that's sort of like the philosophical one. But uh, maybe I can also distinguish it into like three different um, levels. The first one is that many view circular economy as, you know, another form of waste management. And that is something that has been, I think, in the Czech Republic quite vivid, and it is still there. For example, the Ministry of Environment, I think there for some time they were actually considering, so okay, so maybe we'll just rename our, our department, circular economy department, and it's you know resolved. So from waste management department, we're gonna move to circular economy department. But that's not the answer, right? It's like, if you would be solving just the production of waste, it's like if you would be, um, let's say, if you would be sick and you would be taking a, a pill to, to get sick very quickly, you wouldn't be focusing on why did I got sick, but only on uh, the results. And the same thing is with circular economy. We cannot focus just on why are we producing waste or uh, how can we actually deal with that. But uh, there are some reasons for that. So that's like one a narrow view of circular economy. Let's focus on waste management and let's optimize our system so that we don't waste that much. The other is focusing a, a little bit more broadly, and that's more in the in the area. Okay, so how can we optimize the production? How can we you know produce materials which are which are maybe lightened? How can we produce services where we need less materials, thereby being more circular? That's the another uh, perception. And the third one, and it's my um, favorite definition of circular economy, it's um, more in the terms of uh, providing the services and needs with the least materials. And there you are also you know, looking into completely different pathways, such as, okay, maybe I don't even need this product, or maybe I can just borrow it for, for some time and then I can give it back. So, and these are like three different maybe perceptions of how, how we, we can view it, because Sometimes we're just focused on waste management, sometimes we're focused on optimization of systems, but the other one I think is uh, a much broader. So it's not easy, I would say, in, in answering the topic. I think circular economy often brings more questions than answers, uh, but I think it's uh, difficult to, to ask these questions. I would love to hear some numbers well, uh, because I I, I, love, I love hard data, right? And uh, where, where I'm where I'm going is uh, just just uh, to to continue this discussion to what is what is actually the potential of these principles you are talking about, and if there are some good practices or maybe studies of uh, of, of potential of some of these tools in inside the circular economy, in uh, in the great environmental issues we have nowadays, like climate change, like uh, biodiversity loss, and maybe some other things. So is, is there is there something specific that we can say that because of this circular tool, we can, I don't know, uh, produce less greenhouse gases in this kind of sector? So if, if you could just mention some of these examples, it would be great. And if you if you know, if you have, have some numbers, or at least, you know, show us the direction where, where this is going. I give you some data. About uh, 2010, we had uh, an average in Czech Republic personal production of waste about 300 kilos per person per year. Now, after 12 years, we have uh, more than 500, 500 kilos. That means that it's still increasing. 
increasing and we consume a lot of uh, European funds for solving the waste problem, but the money are consumed somewhere. We have a new biogas uh, production, we have a better landfills, better incinerators, but as a result is that we have still more and more waste. And uh, this is uh, such evidence that uh, we have some trouble. We are in trouble and uh, we don't know how to, how to really make it better. And what Pavel told, it's, I, I fully agree, the circular economy is not uh, waste management version two. <laughs> it's it's really a new and more broader concept. Starting, not starting, maybe ending with uh, uh, waste management. But waste management itself is not a part of circular economy. Of course, it's part of our business and our daily life. But uh, what uh, consists uh, circular economy of? is a lot of tools and the last and the worst of it is the recyclation. If we cannot do something better, we should recycle. But this is really from the concept of circular economy is the worst. And for me, this is the one that comes up uh, in my mind as a first one, like circular economy, okay, it's recycling. I have to take the plastic bottle to yeah, the container. That's why I want to, I'm circular. To, uh, <laughs> because our, our, our society, maybe because of the activities of our ministry, but they do what can do, they do a lot of, but uh, the principle is that uh, the, the recycling is the worst case in the circularity. Of course, it's good, it helps, it's better than to dispose the material, but it is the last. We should also apply other tools, starting with the economy tools, like uh, the, the real value of the man work, the sharing economy, some other, a lot of other aspects, Power can, can give you a lot of other examples. I'm more technical, so I don't, I'm not familiar with all of them, but, uh, it's necessary to apply, apply also other tools than just environmental technology like uh, recycling version 2, 3, 4. So I don't have exact numbers because uh, your question was what the circular economy as a tool can improve. But it's not a tool, it's a concept of several tools. And if we apply recycling as one tool, we can make it better, let's say, 10%. If we apply uh, other, maybe some economical tools, uh, we can make it more effective in additional 30%. I don't know. But uh, this is it that we very often mixed the, the topics. Circular economy is concept. It's uh, several tools we should apply to be more uh, free of materials. I mean, uh, free in the term of the uh, resource security, because we are very dependent on the materials. Our society extremely dependent on the fossil fuels, on the, some rare metals, and uh, cannot imagine what happened if we do not have it in short future. And uh, not only these, also the phosphorus is crucial substance. We, we are very afraid what happened if in a couple of tens years we will be short on phosphorus because current way of agriculture is fully dependent on the phosphorus mined from Morocco or from one part of Russia. Of course, in agriculture we use also nitrogen but the nitrogen is uh, the production in ammonia, for example, is heavily dependent on the f cheap energy, again, based on the fossil fuels. So our society is very sensitive in, in resources. So what you're saying, it's not just an environmental concept. It's also very much connected to material security and yes, uh, to yes. the way we yes. do things, we produce things. Yes. Okay. And this is... Uh, point I want to stress that it was not very often to be heard in the context of circular economy, the resource security, but I think it is a real cornerstone for it. And maybe this can, can give us the circular economy into a bit different light and maybe more progressive for the future. Maybe, maybe a similar thing that happened to uh, decarbonization of uh, electricity in Czech Republic lately. It used to be an environmental topic, and now it's national security topic, and now now it's a 
energy security topic and, and maybe this reframing would help uh, to, to push more circular economy principles. Uh, yeah, maybe around the data, I, I've already mentioned some in the in the first input. Um, and the municipal waste part is just one part of the waste we produce, right? And we said that recycling is, is the worst, but even worse is landfilling and incinerating it. Uh, but still, uh, half of the municipal waste is being just I'm always saying, in the age of AI, <laughs> the only thing we can do with waste is put it from one place to the other and, and leave it there for hundreds of years, right? It's a bit absurd in these terms. Um, uh, so if we recycle, let's say, one third of the municipal waste, we can be happy. But I mean, that's a very far uh, path towards circularity. Um, and the other thing, or maybe a bit more broadly, I think the reason why circular economy is a strategic topic in the Green Deal and in the context of the European Union, it's first, well, we've realized that we cannot solve the uh, climate crisis just by focusing on energy. You know, there's a lot of embodied emissions in the cement, in the in concrete, in steel, in uh, all of the heavy uh, energy materials, and the more we optimize it, the less emissions we consume. So one first thing is that the EU has it as a climate strategy, basically. The other one is intuitively, if you take uh, a lot of resources from the ground annually, uh, you're going to destroy a lot of nature, right? So that's the reason why there's very close link to biodiversity. The third one is a resource oriented point of view. Uh, if you look on the global map, Europe is tiny compared to China, compared to the US and uh, our resource abundance is not very high. Therefore, we have to uh, retain the materials somehow, and we try to retain it by the products that are already on the market, thereby utilizing it the most, so resource efficiency or uh, resource security. And the third one, I think, is some sort of innovativeness. It uh, forces us to think about new ways. How do we produce goods? How do we produce economic value? How do we produce uh, how do we increase our GDP? Uh, so these are like four key objectives of circular economy. And unfortunately, on many factors and on many, let's say, indicators, we're very far from actually uh, attaining. It, thank you very much, Ferku, for, for, for some of these specific examples. Um, before we get to your questions, which will be shortly, so if you, if you already have questions, remember them, soon we will get there. Uh, I would like to focus on... Uh, on the Czech context, because that's maybe something that, that we can bring to you who are not made from Czech Republic, all of you. So, uh, how is this topic alive in the in the Czech uh, in the Czech Republic? And uh, you, the two of you, maybe have different uh, experiences from different areas. Like Vladimir is uh, is rooted in the academic environment, so you can maybe talk more about that. Pavel, you you are talking to, uh, or both of you are talking to businesses, to to companies. Um, so, what is the what is the specific Czech approach to the circular economy? <laughs> You're smiling already. I'm looking forward to the answer. And uh, uh, what benefits maybe does it have? And what, what barriers are there? What, uh, what's wrong with it and what's good, what good in it, if I ask this way? Uh, um, to be honest, I think that uh, it's not very well welcomed topic in Czech Republic generally. We we have to do it. Uh, our colleagues from the Ministry of in, uh, Environment, namely from the Department of Wastes, they do a great job. They prepared a strategy for circular economy for next decades in Czech Republic. But to me, it seems to be more like uh, we can do this and we can support it from the funds of EU and it's not some straightforward, similar, easy tool what to do to improve our circularity in our uh, general management or economy. So I'm, I'm a bit uh, skeptical in this now. I see after some time that it's not the topic number one. Uh, five, six years ago, it started to be interesting. The people working in the context of man waste management were, were, uh, were uh, somehow inspired in this. Uh, they, they were supported a lot of recycling technology. And now we are very often talking about the recyclation. We will recycle all the wastes, uh, everything will be uh, blessed because of the recyclation. But, uh, we, this is not the final solution. 
the recycling very often needs a lot of energy, needs some new chemicals going inside, proves another waste. The output, the secondary resources are not always to be used again in as, as the virgin materials, namely in the plastic, because the packaging of uh, food is a very typical example of this. So I, I would like to, to, to apply more tools in, the, in the, our Czech economy. Why I see or where I see the problem is that the circular economy from the governmental perspective is understood like a problem of Minister of Environment. But it is not. It's not, not only. Because we have to solve the circular economy also with the financial sector, with the human, uh, the social aspects. It's also about the uh, social, uh, um, how to say, about man resources, for example, about the different taxes, because we have very high taxes for men work compared to very cheap materials. And this is maybe the principal problem because it's cheaper for you to buy a new glass, for example, than to, I know the glass is not easy to be repaired again, <laughs> but the repairment of the products is very often more expensive than to buy a new device. And this is for me the principal problem. In history, it was common that we uh, use again the fabric, we use again the metals for almost centuries, uh, as long as it was possible. And now we are, uh, we are <laughs> consuming every day a new thing. If you want to have one beer, you drink it and you produce a waste. This is crazy. This is crazy in the principle and no recyclation will change this. We need to work with our habits, and this is what I'm crucially missing in our discussion in the circular economy in Czech Republic. It's not about habits, about a couple of industrial branches, and namely about the wastes. And is it better somewhere else? Like, do you see that in, I don't know, Western Europe or some countries, the discussion is, uh, is better, it's, uh, it's further? I don't have such an overview to, to compare it directly, but uh, I, I know that the waste, the communal, communal waste management in Austria or Germany is quite different compared to Czech. There are different uh, sources of money, it's a different financing system. And if you go to Austria, for example, as a tourist, you have a problem to put away your trash. There are not boxes for it because they have a system that you really do not need product produce such a big volume of the of the waste so it's possible to do but uh, our economy do not welcome this because every every operation in our economy brings money for the state if you produce something it's taxed if you sell it it's taxed if you have to manage it as a waste it also brings money for the state so the will of the state i don't want to personalize it just generally uh, the the will of state to change this it's very weak because why we need a money as a state or government and if we will fulfill need of a man without a consumption of resources and the produ produ production of the taxes it's not in the in what the state needs or wants this is strange it, it will be it, it is i think a nightmare for economists that we will just fulfill our needs and do not buy something <laughs> so again we are going for some systemic change for change of habits more than just send something yeah, of course that may be, uh, for, for last word the in economy we do not count with the externalities the environmental externalities this is maybe one of the crucial points in this could you share your review pavel on the yeah, circularity absolutely. in the Czech context yeah yeah um so when i was uh, studying abroad um and then i was coming back i was actually at first i was worried that i won't find a job in sustainability Luckily, I think now it's there's a movement around it also forced by regulation and other um, factors. But so there, it's happening. Sustainability, I think, is slowly but surely moving forward. Whether circular economy as one part of it is 
part of it. That's another question, and I would lean towards uh, uh, this view that it is not viewed as a priority. Um, I think one of the key issues is that, uh, generally speaking, environmental topics in the Czech Republic are not that well received. Uh, if I think there was a questionnaire by uh, some institution, and what was the perception of the of inhabitants towards the Green Deal that was mostly negative. But once we've put uh, more specific thoughts behind it, like do you care about nature? Do you care about, you know, how where your kids will be growing up? It's positive, but we can label it Green Deal. And maybe similarly, some view circular economy as a Green Deal label in many terms, and that's not a good thing. Another thing I think is um, a bit of a problem-oriented mindset that Czech people have. We tend to... we. I think we're great risk managers. Uh, we tend to find risks anywhere and uh, we're good at it. I mean, we should be proud of the fact that we can do so, but on the other side, we could also be maybe a bit more uh, proactive in terms of what's going to happen, what's in front of us. I think in many aspects, we have not still been able to um, tell to ourselves in the Czech Republic that the change in front of us, in front of us is in inevitable in terms of the um, actions that we need to take care of. And we still have the perception, okay, so we're largely industrial. I think we're the second most industrial country in the EU, um, uh, if you if you put it into gross value product, gross value added. Um, you know, we have a large automotive sector. Uh, the energy sector is quite intense. So we tend to kind of protect it in a way. You know, we, we, this is how we've built our identity after the 1990s, and this is how we've grown. And now someone is forcing us to change it, uh, but not a little bit, but dramatically. That's uh, what you have mentioned. It's not just a slight tweak to something. So it's thinking about Green Deal more generally, but I think it mirrors the topic of circular economy as you know one one uh, concept of the of the whole movement. And why it's not happening, I think, uh, aside of these mental challenges maybe that we have, I think certainly business models are not uh, profitable. Uh, for some, from my perspective, I think the only thing that can help is regulation uh, because then you actually tend to, you know, increase the tax on the waste, thereby as a producer, you're now starting to think, okay, so what can I do with it if I'm paying that much? Uh, the other part is, you know, making the virgin products more um, more costly because then again you're thinking about, okay, this is too costly for me. Can I find something cheaper, which is already a waste? So regulation is one thing. I think some know-how and technical uh, opportunities are still are, um, missing. And last thing, I think it's a lack of vision in many aspects in terms of uh, where are we going. Uh, what do we need as a country? So uh, it's not a one-sided uh, answer. And are there some uh, good practices, good examples from outside of the Czech Republic that uh, I will ask, that inspire you? That you would say to yourself, okay, I wish we in Czech Republic would do it as, I don't know, somewhere else. Yeah. Maybe some someone from the audience would know. Maybe Brussels is, is super innovative in that. Uh, at least the, the bureaucrats are, I think. Um, uh, I mean, Netherlands is sometimes uh, viewed as a front runner in circular economy. They're also very good in in presenting it that way. <laughs> uh, no offense if there's anyone. I was studying there and I love the country. Um, I think also Nordic countries view it, uh, but that's more, again, viewed uh, in the mental sphere. Um, and there are many startups coming up from Nordics, you know, that focus on this issue. And I think once you build the environment, the innovative ecosystems around it, of course, in order to make circular economy happen, you need the capacities, you need the skills, you need the knowledge, and it's not going to happen just from day one. So these countries are actually, um, you know, step forward or step in front of us. And if circular economy at one point will be mainstream, and I believe it will be, then we're going to lag behind. In uh, as opposed or in, in comparison to these countries. Thank you, thank you very much for those insights. Um, well, I would love someone else to do my job now. So please, if you have any questions, uh, let's ask them, let's discuss because we've covered some of the topics concerning circular economy and there are much more. So uh, 
What are your questions? Come on, let's let's go ask, and we will have someone with microphone over somewhere. Yeah, microphone is behind you. It's coming right up. So first question, go for it. Hello, good evening, and thank you for the interesting discussion and presentation. I actually have a. At the beginning, a remark and then a question for both of you, maybe. And it touches the, um, the topic of uh, mainstreaming and accessibility of circular economy. Because uh, from my personal experience, it's not very easy to be conscious about not producing waste, not buying anything extra, uh, not giving up the temptation to buy uh, new clothes, shoes, but even just not food or cooking. Cooking produced such such a waste. I didn't uh, I didn't imagine how much waste I produce uh, during COVID when I started cooking every day. And um, well, it's not easy. It's expensive. And my question is how to make circular economy more accessible to normal people, because I don't want to generalize, but I can imagine that as a society, uh, we throw the, the garbage into, or we, we recycle into the blue and the yellow and the green, thinking how are we saving the planet, and that's it. That's where we stop, basically. So maybe some, some tips how to how to mainstream it better because I think it's also confusing. For instance, you have these biodegradable packaging, but you can't recycle them into biodegradable waste. At least in Brussels, you have to put it in a normal waste. So why is it then biodegradable? What does it mean? Where I can recycle? Or you have a one plastic bottle, but it's made of different plastics. So then it's not recyclable. So yeah, that's my, my question and my remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. It's a very, very good question. And it's really hard to give you a good answer and satisfy you with the answer. Uh, I, I feel that common man should focus what is good for himself. This is for me, we, we in product ecology usually work with the concept of functional unit of any products that gives you some specific function. And this function is achieved by some material, energy, etc. And sometimes we forget what is the function of the specific product. In the context of circular economy, we very often discuss uh, in Czech Republic, but it's very similar in other countries also, what is better to pack the Coca-Cola in plastic or in glass bottle. And now we, we uh, there are wars in between the glass producers and plastic producers or aluminum can producers. But the problem is that we drink too much of sweet drinks. And if, if you change your habits, if you focus on what is good for yourself, then you decide, okay, I, I don't need to drink too much Coca-Cola. It will be good for me, for my health, and as well for the waste. And sometimes I, uh, I, it's my personal play in this. I try to find the solution in very often contradictory situation to make steps behind and uh, try to do something like this. Another example I have from the food packaging that uh, my experience is that if we have something like pre-cooked soup or some such uh, products which are artificially prepared and this has to be packed with more intensive packaging because they are more sensitive for transport, for wet, for temperature. So if you want to discuss the topic of the nutrition with the medicine doctors, they give you answer, try to eat fresh food. Don't use some prepared thing like this. And in such a case, you will not buy the pre cooked soap, which is packed usually in aluminum, plastic, paper, a couple of materials in common, and you cannot separate it, you cannot, re cannot recycle it officially. So then it's better to, to cook 
you, you told it, <laughs> it was a lot of waste, of course, but maybe if you cook from the primary sources like potatoes and so, it will be less waste compared to pre-cooked products. I know it's not it's not hundred percent answer to you, but I wanted to give you such a approach, example of approach to this. We very often discuss about the site problems. Is better to plastic or glass? No, the problem is that we drink too much of sweet water. For it. Remember this, because it's true. We drink it too much, it's not good for our health. And usually the plastic producers, and I'm very, very, I hear it almost every day. They told us if we will need to have the deposit system for bottles, it will cost a lot of money and consumer will pay it. And they make a stress or to our government to do, do not apply a deposit system. But I think, why not? Why not? The consumer should pay it. I think it's, it's necessary to be expensive for the produce uh, consumer because the sweet water is not you need for your life definitely not and the uh, problem is that uh, the producers of plastic bottles very often told us that the consumer will pay it but this is a manipulative uh, manipulative uh, explanation because in the current system of course not the first consumer will pay it but the others will pay it because the plastic becomes as the waste part of the waste that means that our communities has to pay it partially and that means that the input and the money are split it in the social way to all of us but the benefit is for single one and we need to change it so okay let pay high deposit let pay high money for sweet water because it's not uh, life need <laughs> you, you cannot live without it and maybe better than with it I, i was just playing in my mind with, with your principle so when i when i will be deciding in winter if i if i should buy this or that jacket i just need to move to southern france and then everything will be okay. No, I'm just joking, of course. Pavel, would you like to add something to the first question before we go on? No, I think I'm good. There was another one. All right, so there, there is another answer. question over here. Thank you very much. I actually have a complimentary question to what you just said. So, uh, because you were focusing on Coca-Cola, for instance, which is indeed unhealthy, but what about water or something healthy? So in, in this sense, what would you do? What would be the policy initiative? Uh, would you recommend, for instance, some uh, subventions for uh, healthy and how do you define healthy or would you put in this category? So, because we can all agree that some products, uh, it's it's good if the consumer pays, but what about other, uh, let's say, uh, products uh, full of uh, vitamins or whatever? Yes, it, we don't have time to, to name all of these uh, examples, but let's start with the water. Again, what is the function? Function is to uh, transport potable water for the population in, let's say, Czech Republic or Belgium. If this is the function, then you should choose the way which is the more, let's say, environmental friendly and more effective. We have at least 98% good tap water. Of course, there are some situation and or some location where it is not, but then we can use some other system like packed water, of course. But generally, we have a good tap water. So, so there is another solution for such a case. Of course, not always, not everywhere, but uh, we can do it. The plastic bottle filled with the table water is just a perfect business for the plasticers. It's not what for, for water managers. I'm originally water manager at our faculty, so I'm a bit, <laughs> uh, how to say, I'm not objective in this because water on for water managers has to be in the pipes because it and it has to flow. It's another specific specific question. Don't save the water in our tap because we need to to flow it 
because then it's healthy, it's fresh. Otherwise, standing water can be a problem, but it's for long, long other dis discussions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We, 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 we will not be taking one by one all the products we can think of. So if any, anyone else has a question, what well, else it's, should it's, it's good. It's a good approach. I yeah. know, uh, just, just a minute. I saw Pavel that you wanted to add something. I okay, think so, it's a good one. All right. So, so let's do milk. The question was about what about milk? So let's do milk and then we probably move to, to, to some other topics. Uh, yes. Uh, before I try to, uh, I really, I really do not have answer for milk, but I try to. Before this, I would like to uh, recommend to sort the problems. If we have, let's say, communal waste, we can make a proportion what is the highest content. It will be first probably the plastic for the beer, for the sweet water, and for common water. The milk will be less. So uh, don't forget, but uh, st let's start with the principle. And the principle is the beer, we drink too much in Czech Republic, as, as like the sweet water. Also, there is a way for improvement. But with the milk, uh, it's, uh, it's a specific question. Uh, I discuss it with the, with the nutrition experts, and they are not unified in the answer how much of, uh, how many, I'm not short sure in English, sorry, uh, how, many, how much of that we need. Some told us it's just for children, don't drink it too much. Some other told us, okay, it has to be, but depends on quality. Uh, we can compare Tetra Pak, plastic bottles, uh, glass bottles, everything of this can, uh, can be somehow sorted. And I can say you that if you will use a glass bottle for the milk and transport the milk from one part of the country to the another, another one, it will be more environmental problematic in compared to plastic, it is. The question is that we usually do not know how to account the environmental burden of the plastic. Until now, there is not a fixed methodology about the microplastics. We know that they are a lot in almost all, all environment compartments, but they are not uh, finished the toxicological studies and some other evolution. So it's not easy to compare what is better. It's uh, in LCA, this is the principal question. What is better? One ton of carbon uh, greenhouse gases or one gram of toxic cadmium? How to compare? And this is a bit similar with the plastic and the paper in the packaging. It's not easy to compare two very different materials with two different potential environmental impacts. So I'm sorry, I don't have the clear answer on, for the milk, but uh, last comment is uh, we, a couple of years, uh, developed such a indicator, we call him P2P, package to product comparison. And the, my idea was, what is worst, the stuff inside, or the, the milk, or the packaging? And it's very interesting to see that if you have a product which itself is environmental important, has high impact, but we need it and or we want it, then the role of packaging is not so important because the packaging is just part of it. But in some specific cases, and they are not very rare, the packaging plays significantly higher role than the product itself. Then it is strange. Namely, it is the packed water. There is about several order of magnitude is higher the impact of the packaging in compared to the product inside. In the milk, there will be maybe different case because the milk production is more complicated, produce more emissions starting from cattle, uh, and so, etc. And if we will accept that the milk is crucial for our our food system, then we accept also some part of the environmental impact. I remember when I was uh, young, before the revolution, we had the milk packed in such uh, pouches, per liter, just, just plastic pouch. Of course, it was strange. We were happy after the revolution. Now we have it in Tetra Pak is more better. <laughs> but if I compare it from the environmental point of view, maybe it was 
better. It was less material, just a few grams. Not easy to solve. The best is to have your battle and to go to your neighbor with the cattle. I, I know this is more in, in, in Austria. It's quite common. Of course, the big cities is different case, of course. But if you are in small, smaller towns, in villages, and as it is, for example, in Austria, as I know, it's quite common to go with your, your can for the fresh milk. Maybe this is the solution. From the, uh, from the sustainability point of view, this also support the social contact with the people. So another benefit. I, I like it that you spoken like a true academic. Basically, you are saying it's more, more complex than that. <laughs> right. Thank, thank you very much. Pavel, yeah, I just wanted to follow up. Um, I think the, the devil is hidden in the details that if we, um, in some aspects, the circular economy is, is an ideal case is we won't be consuming anything right at the end of the day it's an over exaggeration but uh on the maybe plastic bottle case right if we uh, remove it we're not using it we're losing some european business that was here for quite some time and they have some interest and they provide some jobs they provide some uh, economic value to the economy as a whole and i think that's that's the devil which is hidden in the detail that uh we cannot just solve this problem by getting rid of something because then there are other variables that we have to follow it's just we i mean we have in the environmental sphere we don't have just carbon emissions there are other um, um, uh, other environmental impacts that we have to follow but we don't have just just environmental indicators we have jobs indicators we have economic indicators and that's the tricky part like how do we make up the system so that it actually generate some revenue as well whilst not uh, consuming the the products that we have and i think that's like the i don't have an answer to that it's just the 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 magnet that kind of drags me to the circular economy because the questions circular economy asks as you were mentioning in the beginning yeah and uh it's a tough one i mean we've we've optimized our economy based on one variable and that's uh gdp basically okay so how can we set up the system so that we are actually um, you know, produ producing as much prosperity as we can. And I guess if 8 billion people on the planet would sit on the one, around one table and they, they would be like, okay, I guess the environmental impact we're having on the earth is quite bad, right? Let's do something with that. And, you know, the most, uh, let's say, rich people on the planet would be, okay, so you didn't have to work that much. Maybe I can give you something. Um, and we can then put less pressure on the planet and then, you know, be all in, in this in this fairy tale happy. But it's not happening. I mean, Europe is one place, there is there are other interests. We have to we have also some security objectives, thereby we cannot just uh, in my view, uh, degrow our economy. So um, many complex <laughs> variables. I have another example. I'm not a milk drinker. Beer? But just, I, I will just ask you to be brief because I, I would like to uh, answer some other questions if there are in the audience because we are very much focusing uh, a lot for uh, one question. So Too much on milk. Too much milk, too much milk and too much sweet drink. Uh, yogurt so, is okay. <laughs> you know, maybe... I, I a short example with the yogurt. Uh. <laughs> no problem. So you have one minute go for it <laughs> okay uh, we did such study for the yog yogurt producer in in czech republic and uh, you were joking, how okay. to pack it to plastic to paper to combination and of course the result was that if you have a high volume of the yogurt it's better compared to the to the packaging because per 100 of gram it's less packaging but in my case when I eat the small yogurt, it's fine, I eat it. But if I have the big one, half a kilo, I like it and I eat also the one. So as a result, it's high impact. <laughs> okay, thank you. So so again, uh, what's, what's the core problem? And now this is yeah. your will. <laughs> our, our will, our consumption, what we want. What we want. Okay, let's cover some more questions. Oh, there are many of them. So we have to be brief, gentlemen. So, uh, yeah, lady in the second row. Yep. Only yes or no questions, please. <laughs> um, so I'm Nayantara from Zero Waste Scotland. 
And I think, Pavel, you had asked earlier examples from the audience, and I think I'd like to emphasize that Scotland's doing a lot of cool things. Um, we have a circular economy minister, which is something not very many countries have. Um, we published a circular, circularity gap report, so we actually measured what the material flow analysis is, and we found out that in Scotland it's just 1.8% circular. That means we have 98% gap in trying to reach that more circularity in, in our economy. Um, and we also have a circular economy bill. So it's not a waste management bill, but it's actually a circular economy bill that's going to be tabled soon and a route map. And together they look at packages all the way from designing to the end um, waste management. So I do encourage people to look at Scotland because I think we're doing a lot of cool things and, and leading the way. Um, but my question is that we've spoken a lot about circular economy and the environment and biodiversity. But there's also social impact, both good and bad, right? So if we stop consuming, then there's an impact in supply chains, not only within our countries, but abroad. Um, people don't produce, for example, textiles, they're not going to be making clothes, so the jobs go down. But there's also the positive impact, for example, the jobs that come in, repair, remanufacturing, recycling, interactions through sharing libraries. So I guess I would just like to get your thoughts on how can we com not only uh, hitch the circular economy agenda to sustainability and biodiversity, but also maybe to the well-being economy? So if you have any thoughts about that, it'd be good to hear about it. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, maybe the, the milk example was a good one. Uh, but um, yeah, I know that there's a, a debate a lot about circular economy that it omits a lot the social dimension that it's kind of like just technocratic, kind of focusing on recycling and et cetera. Um, I must say that this discussion is not really happening in the Czech Republic, I mean, in terms of like connecting these two dots. And I personally, I'm also, um, um, sometimes I feel that if we have too many targets, we're gonna miss all of them. The other point would be, um, uh, if you focus on just one thing, that you're, then you're going to miss a lot of other things in the system. So uh, I must say it's not my uh, primary uh, concern uh, in terms of uh, circularity, but um, I think it's definitely in a topic that has to get some focus. But uh, I don't have specific examples on to which focus on, sorry. Me, no, me too. Maybe the sharing economy could be a good example, as, as we mentioned. This would could be very, very well and uh, very good. But what I'm really missing again in Czech Republic to support these economic systems and to sharing economy. Because the economy is, it's better to, uh, to buy more things because then to share it. And it's this problem in the economy. Yeah, and I think sharing economy, I think is interesting. It, and I do uh, think it's part of sort of economy. Some, someone do doesn't. Um, um, but sorry, I wake up really early uh, this morning to get, to get here. Um, uh, yeah, with the sharing economy, I think it had a, a good hype at the beginning, but then a lot of people, there's like a lot of mental challenges, right? It was more like, I'm not going to share this thing with someone else. It's just mine. And that's so my, for example, my girlfriend, she's afraid of hotels because she, she's afraid there's going to be bed bugs every, anywhere and she's going to take it to her. So you have to buy a house for every exactly, vacation. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a camper van. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of the things is just um, a mental roadblocks we have and it's entrenched habits. Let's go for the next question. There were a couple of hands in the air. Yeah, microphone in my hand, so I will continue. Um, hi, good evening. My name is Karin Jancikova. Currently I work for Konrad Adenauer Stiftung here in Brussels and uh, I'm focused on climate energy agenda. Um, the name of the program is Multinational Development Policy Dialogue. Very com Complex, <laughs> complex name, but uh, basically we are trying to uh, bring perspectives from developing countries towards EU and back. Um, and I would like to go a bit beyond um, circular economy seen as a re recycling and our personal contribution to it and focus more on large scale things. And um, you mentioned your studio or consultancy where you support industries in in becoming more sustainable and uh, uh, circular. And I know also you, Pavel, that you worked on this kind of uh, decarbonization of industry via circular economy strategy. 
I'm interested in what's the um, uh, status quo of this strategy, whether it's been kind of adopted or partially, because it could be interesting. And um, um, my other question is um, some good examples from your practice as a consultant with Czech uh, industries and companies, um, where there are already some success stories of using uh, circularity a means of a use of the material because um, I see we have a huge dialogue with India now about green steel, what actually green steel means and the role of hydrogen, green hydrogen. And uh, I saw very nice advertisement coming from the UK using a UK model who is actually swimming in the emission, as they call it, um, brackets emission, coming from producing green hydrogen, which is actually water. And she is producing a moisturizer for your face, and I think this is the way how to advertise to be circular. And actually, if you use a green hydrogen, then the waste is actually water, which is very nice. Um, so I just wanted to know about the, how to say, your experience with Czech companies and about the role of science and research and experimenting in making really circularity being a reality. Thank you. Hope not too long question. Thanks. Okay. There was a question for both of you, so maybe you can share it. Yeah. Uh, I have uh, experienced that the companies are more interested in uh, carbon footprinting and some other indicators, not, not directly on the circular economy itself. They usually want to achieve some goals like uh, less uh, CO2 emissions, for example, and looking at ways how to achieve of this. Uh, some example where it worked, in the context of circular economy was uh, in automotive. We are working for Maxion company. It's uh, one of the biggest car wheels producer award. Every six car, six wheel of cars is from this company. It do not produce it under their brand, but under brand of Volkswagen, Audi, etc. And uh, we, we do for them the LCA and looking ways how to diminish their carbon footprint. And now if they see that, for example, for the aluminum cast wheels, it's a principal the resource of aluminum. So they are now looking for a supplier from different countries. And because it's domino effect, if they have supply, for example, from Italy or from Turkey or Iceland, French, they also work with the aluminium producer also for the day suppliers, with their supplier of the energy. So it's more connected to the value chain evaluation than just the circular. But now the question is namely, what about the secondary aluminium? What we face is the principal problems. What is the secondary aluminium? and how to calculate its carbon footprint. We can calculate everything, of course, but the uh, rules, how it will be applied, because uh, if it is post-consumer or post-industry, it's quite a different in the, in the values. And uh, the, the price of the secondary aluminum with low carbon footprint could be very high because it could be very interesting. Now this uh, will be the problem about the legislation or the methodology, how to how to assess it. But I know that the uh, the companies like these, but they are more internationally operated, they are interested in the supply chain in the context of circularity. So this is starting to be. And you mentioned also the hydrogen. I have personal experience with the hydrogen evaluation. We did the carbon footprint evaluation of uh, secondary, secondary, the the hydrogen production from the chemical factory, which has the uh, dialyze process for the some other chemical production and as a side product there is a hydrogen and they they had the idea that this hydrogen because it's a side product it is with zero carbon footprint <laughs> but it's not correct because you have to allocate somehow the, the emissions of course and now they were very surprised when we give them the results try to mass allocation or value, uh, man, monetary allocation it was different. And this will also uh, 
need, need to be solved how to unify the methodology of this uh, calculation because it, it plays a significant role in next months how and what materials will be declared maybe the new new directive of urban greenwashing will open the debate about this but i'm a bit skeptical now so all the all the energy for the hydrogen production in this case was the fossil of course but it was a side product from from the, the production of uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not easy this, this. Now, try to you. I don't know. Um, I think to, more to your question. Um, I think circular economy and the decarbonization agenda, and that's also why we've studied the report. I think it's coming in terms of that companies will focus more on the on the part. Um, to what extent do our materials have a, a carbon footprint on the environment? For example, in the building sector, we, we know that up until now, we've been focusing on the energy efficiency, on the op operational emissions, and less so on the embodied carbon. Uh, but it's coming also with the ESG uh, topic, with the pressure from the banks, with uh, looking at the carbon footprint, not just in the scope one and two part, but also with the scope three. So what kind of materials am I buying? And then you're asking, how can I reduce my emissions by buying a material which is less carbon intensive? And there you're coming into, okay, is there some supplier who can actually produce a uh, quotation mark, a green cement, green steel, et cetera. And I think this is very close also with the EU regulation, like the uh, Energy Performance Buildings Directive, which will be now focused also on embodied carbon. And developers will have to measure also embodied carbon from, I think, 2027 for some specific buildings. So if that question was also like to, to the, like, how does the circular economy overlap with decarbonization agenda and how the companies are actually reacting to it? I think not yet that much at this point, but it's going to be very soon until it's coming. And in terms of the practical examples, I think Mr. Kochi has uh, many more, um, <laughs> not only milk related, uh, but um, yeah, uh, maybe you can get to it afterwards. We we have time for one or two uh, more questions, so I'd like to focus on, on on some more questions. I I saw your hand over there in the first row, and then the second question, and then we will uh, stay here after the end, and we can discuss it more. So if uh, if we have more questions, and maybe you would like to ask them in more personal space, we'll stay here. Will you stay here? Yeah, they will stay here too. <laughs> so so it's okay. All right. So your question. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Marketa Krejci, Eurobureaucrat. Uh, so the question is very easy. What shall we, Eurobureaucrats, uh, European, do to uh, get support of the Czech citizens for the Green Deal? What we do wrong? And second question is also, if you could uh, choose any uh, reform that you could do in Czech Republic or apply any measures to improve circularity, what would it be? <laughs> Will you begin? <laughs> I I may begin. <laughs> well, because uh, yeah, uh, how to how to get more support for for the green deal is uh, it's part of my job. So, so it's part of what I do, and I uh, I think it's it's not not up to you. You can you can do anything from here. In my in my point of view, I think it's it's up to us, and we we have to explain it. We have to. Uh, find different names for it as you mentioned because green deal is a, is a buzzword and it does, just doesn't work and there are a couple of uh, recently there has been a or it's, it's, an, it's an work a very interesting sociological study uh, what words in czech are dangerous in the czech context and green deal is a very dangerous word never use green deal in czech republic uh, when you uh, when you translate it into czech it's already better Okay, because it's not such a buzzword, and uh, I think uh, yeah, the main main work we we have to focus on is 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 in the Czech context, and I don't think the European Union can can do something from Brussels to the Czech Republic. I think it's done well, and and in my point of view, well, we have to explain it to ourselves and to our fellow citizens. Yeah, maybe if I can follow up, uh, I completely agree. I think. Knowing the local language is really important. And uh, again, when I came from uh, abroad and I came back to the Czech Republic, no one understood what I was saying. It was like talking to the, to an oak 
I had a completely like Euro language that <laughs> no one in the Czech Republic understood. And I think it's really important to be well aware and sensitive to 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 anyone. And as I said, everyone wants a, a clear nature. Uh, but it's more about the words and labels we put into it. So that's one. Another one was, uh, is, today I had a meeting here at one of the foundations and I was discussing with them, okay, so maybe how can we help from the national perspective? Because I know you're focused on the EU perspective and uh, it was a foundation that whose aim was to, like, they have some resources, but they mostly focus on EU legislation and on, let's say, lobbying on side of the NGOs in terms of, like, promoting the right tools and right uh, measures that they think are good and then it will just trickle down to the individual member states and the trickle down part is very difficult and on the ground there has to be someone or some organizations some thought leaders who are explaining it in the local language and i um think that they either need support or they need some sort of you know embracement uh, so i think being being um also focused on the national member states level and not having maybe just the ambition to for everything to be top down that would be maybe one thing and in terms of the measures um i think the very big thing would be landfill fee a very big thing from my perspective would be more uh public more effective public procurement uh, on the national side so like the push and pull factors, um, but there are, I guess, many more. Uh, just a couple more to, to the Green Deal. It's really interesting when you just take the the areas uh, Green Deal focuses on and then show those individually to Czech citizens. They want basically all of them. You know, but because, yeah, do we want to protect our forests? Yes. Do we want to uh, more sustainable agriculture? Of course. Do we want clean air? Yes. We, we want those things, but when we say Green Deal, typical Czech person says, oh, you want to take my uh, combustion engine car in 2035. Yeah, so so yeah, it, it's really, it's really uh, just a detailed work about, about narratives, and uh, I think you need to know the local, or be sensitive to the local history and local fears and traumas, like our parents fought for freedom from the communist era, and now a lot of them feel like Okay, somebody else is telling us what to do, and we need to be sensitive to that. To, I think with, with Green Deal and with all those policies, it's uh, the job is for us to make it ours. So it's not e EU is telling us to do something, but it's we want to do something. And I think it is very much connected to having a vision as a nation, as a state. What you what you were mentioning earlier. What where what who who do we want to be? And I think we are still looking for it a bit in Czech Republic. Yes, last question, please. Thank you for being here. It was wonderful to hear it. it. Sounds like a revolution. And my question is very simple. You mentioned negative externalities. Is there a product sold in Czech Republic or in Europe which you think is missing the point, which means there's zero externalities calculated into its price? So uh, which product kind of should be first taxed so that it's extremely expensive or it costs what it should cost. I know it's very sensitive uh, to say from the environmental point, uh, environmentalist point of view, it is the energy, the product. I know it's it's strange. We are happy that it's not so expensive as we were aware, aware one year ago. But the main, as I, I, I'm not from the social point of view, not from the economical point of view. What we see that for in this time, in last decades, we have the cheapest energy we ever had, ever had as a, as a humanity. It's very cheap to hide something, to just manipulate with something. It's very cheap today. Some years ago, it was not. If you were a king 500 years ago, you had 70 people as your staff. This we have in average every of us, the 70 in energy content. 
That means we are living as a kings in the medieval or Renaissance time. This is because cheap energy. And that's, uh, of course, I'm happy to live this way. It's nice. But I see this is the principal problem. Because if, if, if there is something cheap, we do not feel it as uh, expensive or of, of value. We just consume it. And behind the energy production is the principle in current, I mean fossil-based energy production, is a lot of environmental impacts. And as consequences, this changed our habits very significantly in the last 100, 200 years. We, because of cheap energy, we can produce a huge amount of uh, ammonium-based uh, fertilizers so that we can apply them in huge amounts on countryside. It's fine that we can we can produce a lot of food for new billions of people. But new millions of people will bring another problem. They will consume something, they will need something. It's, it's problematic to say it like this. But for me, if one product, it's the energy. Because it uh, changes us to to keep it. <laughs> So before Ukraine, before the war, so Czech the whole Europe or half of Europe imported cheap gas from Russia. So in those days, would it it would make from what you say, it would make perfect sense to import the gas from Russia for the same price, but tax it heavily on the EU borders? There was a bit problem in the case that there is no the same nature gas from Russia or from Norway, for example. If you calculate with the carbon footprint, one of the indicator can be expressed. The energy, one amount of energy received from the nature gas from Russia has a higher carbon footprint in compared, for example, to Norway, because they have a lot of leakage during the mining and transport, etc. So maybe the taxes or some part of carbon footprinting in the economy could express this. And it was before the war. And it's not only because of the war, but even before the war, we had some uh, analysis and some companies was focused to different suppliers of uh, nature gas, not because of Russia. Because in the new concept of uh, carbon footprint and ESG, maybe this will play a more significant role. And um, if we are, uh, it's more broader discussion than just the circular economy. Energy is quite out of circular and economy. It's strange, but it is. As you ask about the indicators of circularity, the material circularity indicators usually do not play with the energy, with the fossils. It's sometimes strange, but it is, depends on methodology. For me, it's more crucial the final impacts, final environmental impacts, for example, carbon footprint or toxicity, some other of them. But what in the context of uh, Russian war mentioned and the Green Deal, I feel, I, I think more than feel, that it, if we will in 100% apply the Green Deal, it will be more effective than all sanctions we used against Russia. It's more, it will be more powerful to stress the Russia to other, other their borders. And this also maybe explain why the Czech are skeptic about the Green Deal. Because the Czech society is a victim of Russian hybrid war and the communication war. And it's a long time, uh, very, very intensive, uh, intensive work of, of this uh, manipulative information. So green, nobody read Green Deal. Or almost nobody. It's a couple of pages. It's quite fine to, to read it, but uh, all of them hate it. Nobody knows what is inside, but they, they hate it as a result of a hybrid war from the Russia. And it's not only the last two years, it's much, much longer. And uh, if you think who will be the uh, beneficial of the Green Deal, if it theoretically, if it will be 100% realized, it will not be to Russia. 
it will be the victim of the Green Deal because uh, the Russian economy is based on the supplying of the, the, the fossil fuels to Europe. Immediately, if the Europe will be independent of fossil fuels, it will make significant problems for the Russia. They are brave. They are not stupid like it looks now <laughs> because of the war, but they knew this. 10 years ago. So that's why they start to change mind of our society. They do not want we were sustainable because it will be, makes their economical problems. I, I never think that when I started to be the environmentalist that if you want to do sustainability, you start with some environmental technology, but the second step is, will be the geopolitics. And that is the philosophy, of course. But uh, there, were, there was no answers in the technological point of view, but from the ge geopolitical way, it gives me a sense now what happens. And that's really why, why the Czech people are skeptic, not only Czech, about the Green Deal, because of manipulation from the Russia. It was not there. Uh, they don't want we were independent of their gas. And, Maybe just uh, to your question, I think another thing which is quite controversial is food, meat, uh, dairy products, and uh, discussion around putting some tax on that, of course. Back to the milk, right? Back to the milk. Back to and, the milk. Uh, I would not. <laughs> not your good. Not your good. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be the, the person who would be propagating a meat on, a tax on meat in the Czech Republic. I think it would be like similar to tax on beer or something like that. Gentlemen, thank you very much for this inspiring discussion. Thank you all for being here. And for some closing words uh, before before we end, before we go to the after party, please stay with us, talk with us some more because we just graced some topics and, and we have much more to talk about. I would like to, to ask Vendula Novačková uh, to the stage to tell us some closing words. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, that you could join us uh, uh, today. It was, again, very interesting uh, edition of uh, Science Cafe. And it's thanks to you, gentlemen, uh, Vladimir, Pavel and Petr. Thank you so much. And uh, I would like to also uh, thanks to our teams, uh, teams of uh, representation of South Moravian region to the EU, Cello, Czech Center, Brussels, and uh, Prague House in Brussels. Thank you so much, uh, because uh, uh, thanks to uh, teams of uh, all these organizations, we can be here today and uh, we can enjoy the evening. So thank you again. And uh, now I would like to invite you for a glass of uh, South Moravian wine. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> and uh, today uh, also uh, you can uh, enjoy the uh, non-alcoholic wine. So thank you so much. Thank you.